And that was a lot of fun, just seeing what God does in, in healing and uh, demonstrating his power. So we did a, have a very, very good crusade. I appreciate all of you that participated in and uh, helped in that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7. An 86-year-old man and his 85-year-old wife got in the car uh, in New Jersey to go to the store a few minutes away. But as Anthony started driving, he took a wrong turn and he got lost. What does a man do when he gets lost driving? He keeps driving. <laughs> he drove and drove and drove for over 800 miles. <laughs> Two times Anthony stopped. He had to stop and fill up with gas. Do you think he asked for directions? Absolutely not. Kept driving. 24 hours later, they finally were able to make it back home. How did they make it back home? Because they got into a car accident. Ran into another car, and the police finally helped get them home. So, you know, if the store is a couple of minutes away, and it's been a couple of hours. So the question is, how long are you going to go in the wrong direction? So that is actually the, the title of the sermon, a little shortened, How Long in the Wrong Direction. The scripture that we're going to read tells of God's people who they had lost the ark of the presence of God. God was no longer real to them in the nation of Israel, you can read in, in uh, chapter 6 in your own time of how God did a miracle. The ark, the presence of God came back to Israel. But the, we're going to read for 20 years, they never brought the presence of God back to where it was supposed to be. Going in the wrong direction. And so that's the question that I'm going to pose to every person that's here this morning. If you are going in the wrong direction, how long? How long are you going to keep going in the wrong direction? 1 Samuel 7, we'll read four verses. 1 through 4, Then the men of Kiriat-Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill. They consecrated Eleazar his son to keep or take care of the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in Kiriat-Jerim a long time it was there for 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals, and the Ashtoreths, and they serve the Lord only. How long in the wrong direction? Let's talk about the wrong direction for a moment. The context of our passage, you have to understand what's going on before this verse. The ark of God, this holy fancy box that God's presence resided in, had been lost in battle. The Philistines captured it, as I said. Read in your own time, chapters Five and six, God does a miracle. He fights the false uh, Philistine gods. Dagon smashes that idol in the temple and uh, torments the Philistines with uh, problems until they say, let's get rid of the ark. A miracle. The enemies of God send the presence of God back. So that is a great miracle. But in the story that we read, Sometimes people make snap decisions. They decide things on the spur of the moment without thinking it through. You know what happened is the, they, uh, the Philistines put the ark of God on a cart and it, it, uh, uh, the cows supernaturally come back to Israel. And uh, so what God's people did, some guys were curious 
hey, I wonder what's in the box. And they opened it and thousands of them died. And so now out of that, they, uh, were, they were killed for looking in the ark. They weren't supposed to do that. So they made a snap decision. People tend to do this sometimes. Like they didn't think it through. They didn't pray about it. They made a snap decision that was not wise. It was not good. So they said, hey, let's just put it here in Kiryat Jira. It, it didn't belong there. So snap decisions. Decisions on the spur of the moment. Why do we make decisions that are not good for us on the spur of the moment? Maybe because of emotion. Some people, these people, they were hurting when their friends died. Angry, confused, afraid. Some people, emotion makes them, they just suddenly do something because of emotion. Maybe it was a sudden urge that they have. That's a lot of people, they get into trouble. I, I you know, I wonder what it would, don't wonder. Stop that. But some people, they get into trouble. They make snap decisions. Many people, when they make snap decisions, their intention is that these decisions only last for a short time. I'm sure the people thought, you know, these people got killed looking at the ark and like, I don't know what to do with the ark. Uh, let's just put it in Kiryat Jiriam here. Just let's put it there. I'm sure their intention was, let's, we're not supposed to put it there, but man, I'm freaked out. I don't know what to do. Let's just leave it and we'll get it later. This is what people do. They make decisions and in their mind, it's only going to be for a while. You have Christians, they step back from their commitments. They're involved in ministry and they go, you know what, I just need to take a break for a little while. There are people that get involved in sin. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to backslide. Yeah, this little thing, I probably shouldn't do it, but just a little bit. There are people, they develop bad attitudes, bitterness, just, you know, some, some of you see it, they come into church funky. They got a bad attitude. They, they, they probably know they shouldn't be like that, but they're thinking, you know, it's not good, but I'm upset. And then when I'm done being upset, then I'll stop having a funky attitude. I'm hurt. I'll fix it later when I feel better. Our scripture shows us the problem with snap decisions is that many times they last longer than you intended for them to last. Verse 2, so it was that the ark remained in Kiryat Jirim a long time. It was there for 20 years. <laughs> there is none of them that said, hey, let's, let's just get rid of God for 20 years. No one thought that. They just thought, I don't know, let's just put it aside. We'll, we'll, get, we'll deal with it later. But 20 years go by. This is what happens in snap decisions. Doing wrong becomes a habit. Doing wrong becomes an instinct. It becomes normal. It's like cigarettes. There's not a single person in the universe who enjoyed their first puff of a cigarette. No one. We choked. We, <coughs> we worked at it. Until it became an instinct. There are some of you right now, you're jonesing like, how long is he going to preach? I need a cigarette. <laughs> we get used to living without the presence of God. There are some of you, you've come into church. It is normal for you to sit in church and not feel a thing. You don't feel anything. It's a habit. Missing God. You get used to not doing God's will. Some of you have gotten used to not being involved. I'm, I'm looking back in old photographs and digging through for my memorial stones. And one of the things that actually surprises me is seeing people that were involved in ministry years ago. Like, no way. Because they haven't been involved in ministry in years, decades. It's become normal. There are people, they have gotten used to not praying, not reading their Bible. They've gotten used to missing church. It's normal now. 
They miss church at every opportunity. So the question is, how do you get to the place? 20 years without God. How do you get to the place where you can go 20 years without God? And our text says the problem was idols. Idolatry, other gods. Verse 4, the, Ish- the Israelites put away their idols of Baal and Ashtoreth. Idols were false gods, but idolatry is not just an old time problem that we no longer deal with. An idol, we're commanded, put away your idols in the New Testament. Idols are things we put our trust in besides God. Some of you trust in people, your job, your looks. It's become an idol. You trust that you can get by with that. An idol is something that gives you meaning or identity. I couldn't be happy in life unless I have this. I'm worthless without this. Money, looks, friends, house, job. If you didn't have those things, in your mind, would your life have any meaning? And see, Baal and Ashtoreth, they were foreign gods. These were not native gods to Jewish people. They were gods from someplace else. They were gods from someone else. And this is often people who are headed in the wrong direction. They often, they have copied gods from the world. They've copied gods from people who are not living for God, what they see in the people around them. The Bible tells us about a man named Lot in the Old Testament that he moves to a place uh, uh, called Sodom, incredibly ungodly. You know the problem with Lot moving to Sodom is he started becoming like the Sodomites. The Sodomites did not become like him. How do I know that? Because in an insane scripture, some perverts from Sodom, they come. You've got some men in the house. They were homosexual. They send them out so we can violate them sexually. And Lot is outraged. That would be terrible. They're guests in my house. How could you even think of that? Have my daughters. What? Yeah, you have them. It's okay to violate them. But you can't violate guests in my house. Lot, where did you get that idea? From the people around him. That's what idolatry does. There there are Christians. They start copying what they see on TV, movies, and what they see on internet and social media. I'm asked from time to time about Christians, you know. It doesn't say in the Bible for a Christian to not get a tattoo or a piercing or a nose ring or whatever you know the question is not thou shalt not the question is where did you get it from I passed it in South Africa I arrived a few months after Tupac was killed and I'd have converts they would come in they'd have a little do-rag and they'd have their clothes I say ah I see you've been listening to Tupac the copying an identity and then it would move on there'd be a new Think about this. They started copying people who are singing about ungodly things, and now that is their identity. I could see it. They're copying the latest movie star. They start taking on an identity because that is how you lose God. And in the text, we see people They have been going in the wrong direction. And the Bible says how sad for 20 years they just kept going. Reading about another couple. Here's another driving story. A couple driving on a long trip. They stopped for gas. The husband drove for more than five hours before noticing he had left his wife behind at the gas station. Finally, he stops. This is pre-cell phone. 
stopped, called the police and asked for the police's help to get in touch with his wife. Finally, he called his wife to say he's on his way back and they asked him five hours. How did you not, and he said, I just didn't notice she wasn't there. Some of you ladies are getting upset. That's right. I know that. That's the way men are. <laughs> but, but again, I'm not, I'm not preaching about driving. There are people, some of you, you come to church, you don't even notice anymore that God's not with you. Because you've been going in the wrong direction, copying the idols of the world. Let's talk secondly about true lament. In our scripture, it says in verse 2 that the people lamented. Verse 2, all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. The word lament means to mourn, wail. It means expressing strong sorrow and remorse for a situation. They come to the point where they are unhappy with the way things were at the moment. Lament. Lament can be the starting point of getting back on the right track. For some people, lament begins with nostalgia, remembering the past. Some of you, this is what God is doing. I am simply telling the story of the past, of how we got here. But what God is doing in some of you, he is stirring. You were there in many of the, those events, and you remember when you were right with God. You remember when you were in love with God when you were involved in God's work. And so that can be helpful. It can be a reminder of when you were doing good and what it felt like back then, so that's not a bad thing. Revelations 2.5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. So lament for some is nostalgia, but nostalgia is not enough. For others, Lament involves complaining. Judges 6.13, Gideon said, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Gideon is complaining. God isn't doing what he used to do. God isn't helping me like he used to. God isn't real to me like he used to be. I don't feel him. I don't sense God in reality working in my life anymore. So that's good. That can be good. And yet it's not enough. See, God wants you to get sick of the way you are. If you're going in the wrong direction... God wants you to get sick of it. He wants you to lament. Come, listen, some of you here, aren't you sick of not feeling God? Aren't you sick of the way you feel dead inside? Aren't you sick of what you're doing right now that's wrong and how you feel afterwards? Aren't you sick of not doing right? Sick of feeling guilty? Sick of not being used, feeling useless because you're not involved in what you know God wants. What God wants is to do a deeper work than emotion. Something has to happen deeper than emotion. It has to be an internal work deep within our hearts. Joel 2.13 says so, rend or tear your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. This is a, an ancient custom. I'm glad we don't do this anymore. Is if you were like really, really upset, you tore your clothes. Like, <laughs> this is obviously pre-Velcro. This would be <laughs> difficult. That, that was kind of what you would do. You'd be at a funeral. It wasn't enough just to give condolences. That's what you'd do. You'd go, ah! 
And, and God says, listen, I don't want you just to tear your clothes. What I want is something in the heart. But ultimately, true lament must involve action. Verse 3, Samuel says, put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you. Let me ask you something this morning. What is it that has taken you away from God? Is it a person? Is it some involvement? Because Samuel says it needs to go. What has taken priority over God? When it's Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, and it's like optional on coming to church. Like, ah, you know, I think I'd rather. It has to go. That, that is true repentance is when you say, I don't want this to be a part of my life anymore. My wife and I pastored in the city of Melbourne in Australia. We were doing a water baptism, had a, a biker come in. This couple, they were rough. He was a biker, he was a drug addict, had gotten saved. We went, they had like a small lake, kind of a glorified pond in a, in a park. That's where we were baptizing in the summertime. This man came down into the water. He's standing there testifying, and he's saying, I have been involved in sin. I've been addicted to drugs, always smoking weed. And there, while he's baptizing, he pulled out a bag of weed, and he said, I've been addicted, and he said, I don't want this anymore, and he dumped it out in the lake, and the fish started floating. To, no. <laughs> you know what he said? It's got to go. That's true repentance. What is it that's taking you away from God? It's got to go. You can't hold on and continue the way you're going and have God, that is true lament. Let's look finally at the response of God because our text shows us the response of God when we decide to repent. Ultimately, you have to stop going in the wrong direction. How does God feel about that when people decide to stop going in the wrong direction? Look at this. God is willing to hear the prayer of the repentant. Verse 9, if we'd have kept on reading, then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Isn't this amazing? At the point we decide to do right, God responds to us. That is incredible. Some of you in your marriage, you have fights that go like this. One spouse does something wrong. The other person is mad. They finally realize they shouldn't have done that and they apologize and the spouse won't let them fix it because they're still mad. Because that's us. Isn't it good that we're not God? Because some of you have done wrong for a long, years. It wasn't like just yesterday. Years have gone by. 20 years later, Samuel says, God, we are sorry and God listens. That's incredible. James 4, 8, draw near. Come close to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. God is willing to hear the prayer of the repentant. He doesn't rub our face in and say, nope, I'm not listening to you. Oh, now you want to get it right. Number two, God gives supernatural help. Verse 10, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines came to attack Israel, but the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines and so confused them that they were defeated before Israel. This is one of the most incredible things about God. Number one, that he listens to us when we decide to get it right. Number two, that he then helps us without putting us on a probation period. Right? God, we haven't been doing right for 20 years and we need you to help us today. Why should God help us now? And yet God does 
a miracle. That is what the Bible calls grace. God does not say, listen, you're going you're to have to put in six months here. I want to see some right decisions over time before I decide to help you. Grace is undeserved favor. I have seen people, they do dumb things. They get arrested. They're going to court. They decide to get right, and God helps them in court. Why should God help you? But he does. I've seen God help people with debt. They got into debt, and God helped them. I've seen people break their relationships, their marriage. They cause the problem, and yet God steps in to do a miracle. God is incredible. Thirdly, he helps us fight the enemy. Verse 13, so the Philistines were subdued. They did not come into the territory of Israel. Do you know what? God can help you overcome the enemy that you allowed in your life. Some of you have habits. You created the habit. And now you can't get free. God will help you. He'll fight for you. You have mindsets. You've gotten used to thinking wrong. God will help you fight. Fourthly, God will help you recover. Verse 14, then the cities the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Do you know what? God can do such a miracle. He can help you get back what you've lost. Joel 2.25, I will restore the years that the locust has eaten. In our text, finally, God wants us to remember these lessons. Verse 12, Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshana, and he named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help, because he says, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. This is a memorial stone, just like I've been teaching in, in Sunday school. A memorial stone was meant to stay there in place, people would pass by and they would remember. You know what God wants you to do? Remember times you returned to him and he helped you. Up to this point, God, I remember, I was foolish, but you were gracious. Remember that. And God wants us to be aware of this in the future. I, up to this point, you know what I think Samuel is also saying? He is honest. He knows people. This probably is not going to be the last time that they are foolish in life. I would like to believe that people would respond to one sermon, come to the altar, and never have a problem again. But it may be that, again, you'll have to come back to God. Stop going in the wrong direction. Let God help you. In 2007, a 15-year-old girl in Australia, Demi Lee Brennan, had a liver transplant. You know what happens when people have a transplanted organ? They have to take anti-rejection drugs because your body will attack the organ that is supposed to save your life. Your body will attack it as the enemy, and so you have to take drugs. Usually, you have to take the drugs for the rest of your life. January of 2008... She became the first known transplant patient to change blood types from O negative to O positive. She has taken on the immune system of her organ donor. First, the doctors assume someone made a mistake because they've always assumed a change like that can't happen. Now they say she is a one in six billion miracle. The blood stem cells in Brennan's new liver invaded the bone marrow, taking over her entire immune system. She now has an entirely different kind of blood, blood that welcomes life rather than death. She said, it's like my second chance at life. She no longer has to take anti-rejection drugs. You know, I, I like that story because I have seen God do that spiritually. People that there is death on the inside and God reaches deep within and does a miracle and transform to where they are nothing like they used to be because that is the power of God. The question that God puts to us this morning is, how long will you go in the wrong direction? Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes, if you would, all across this place. Thank God.
For all of you that are here, you've listened attentively. I appreciate that. Now, I give a challenge. There are people that you are headed in the wrong direction. Some of you have never started going in the right direction. The Bible says we all have sinned. A sinner is simply one who's going in the wrong direction, away from God and away from his word. And there are people that are here, that's you. If you would be honest for a moment, you know you're not living according to the Bible. You know that God would not be pleased with some of the things you're doing and the way you're living. But I'm giving you hope. Jesus loves you. God wants to do a miracle inside of you. He wants to set you free. He can break your habits, the chains that hold you hostage, sin that you cannot get free of. God can do a miracle. There is supernatural power available. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If you're here this morning and you are not right with God, I want to give you a chance to pray this morning. You could pray with an honest heart. God could heal you where you're hurting and broken on the inside. He could give you power to live a new life. How many people here, you say, Pastor Greg, I am not right with God. I know that. I want to be honest and I want God to heal me. I want to turn from my sin. If that is you, you pray with an honest heart. That's how you fix it. Lift up your hand. I see that hand at the back. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hand down. How many others? I need Jesus. I want God to do a miracle in me. Lift up your hand. All across this place, God is dealing with people. You need Jesus. I want God to do a miracle. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Others, you need Jesus. I want to get right with God. You've never done this before. Now's your chance. I have nothing for you to buy. It doesn't cost money. You have to pray. That's what I'm asking you to do. How many here, you want to do that? I want to pray. Turn from my sin. Others, you need Jesus. Lift up your hand. Some of you are backslidden. You have turned away. You literally are going in the wrong direction. And God has not given up on you. He had me preach today to call you back to him. How many backsliders say, that's me. I want to come back. Lift up your hand. I'm not right with God. I know that. And I want to come back. I need God to heal me on the inside. Lift your hand right now. God loves you. He can do a miracle inside of you. Anybody else, unsaved or backslidden, as God would deal. Thank God. I want those that lifted your hand, look up at me. Did you mean that? Yes, you meant that? You meant that? Come here. Come here. I want to have someone pray with you. You can find a place to pray here, and I want someone to help them. I want you all to stand up to your feet. My question, how long are you going to go in the wrong direction? God is dealing with some of you about the idols of this world. Some of you, God's calling, dealing with you about things that have changed. Come and fix that this morning. The altars are open. You can come and talk to God. Our brother's going to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. Like, like me, me. I once, once was lost, but, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing, Amazing grace, how sweet. Sound that, that saved a wretch like me. me. I once was lost, but now, now I'm found. Was, I was blind, blind, but. God, praise God, praise, praise God, God, praise 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 God.
Amazing Grace. Let's sing that out. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. But let's praise God together right now. Father God, I thank you. Oh God, I am grateful for the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I'm asking you to help us right now, Lord God. Amen. Let's bow our heads. And I want to pray, God, there are people that are here. God, they need to get back on track. I am asking you for a miracle. God, I can't talk people into things. Please touch their hearts. God, do not allow people to continue in the wrong direction. Bring healing. Oh, God, restore what has been lost. I'm asking, let there be conviction. Let there draw them with the cords of love so that they can experience grace in their lives again. God, I pray that you would put life, enable them to believe that they can be healed. Let them get back on track. Let the presence of God be real in their lives. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God again. Thank God for his goodness. Oh, God. Praise God. Praise God for his goodness. Thank God. Amen. We are going to be dismissed. I, I want to invite you. New believers, we have a class called Foundations for the Faith that takes place at 5 p.m. That's in the other building, free of charge. We supply all the materials. And then we're going to be praying at 5.30, one hour before the evening service. And then tonight, Pastor Jesse is going to be preaching a completely different service. And that is at 6.30 tonight. Let's believe God. He's going to help us. God bless you. You can be dismissed without formal prayer.